Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Hat Historian. In this video, I will be talking about a hat that is an icon of tropical style, the Panama. The Panama, occasionally known as a Tokia straw hat, as the latter name indicates is a light straw hat known for its breathability and strength. Historically worn in warmer countries with summerweight linen or silk suits, it is still often used in sunny climates to protect the wearer from the sun, as it is comfortable and stylish, though now it can often be seen worn with a variety of outfits. Originally from Latin America, the Panama hat was first developed in the country of, as you might have guessed, Ecuador. Wait. Pre-Incan peoples in the coastal region of what is now Ecuador have for centuries been using the leaves of the Cardaluvica palmata, known locally as the toquilla or hipiapa plant, to make headdresses, as it was strong yet supple and well suited to be woven and shaped. Local hats in pre-Columbian times tended to generally resemble more of a toque, brimless and falling down over the shoulders, hence the name of toquilla straw that the material eventually gained. This practice came to the attention of the wider world when the Spanish arrived in the region in 1526 and claimed it for Spain. The Spanish were reportedly very impressed with the local straw weaving that was so fine and detailed that the conquistadores at first thought that it was batskin. In the century that followed, they would sometimes have local manufacture larger brimmed hats for them out of the local straw, creating the first ancestors to the modern Panama. However, Ecuador was a mountainous region, far from most trade routes, and a little bit of a backwater in the Spanish Empire. Therefore, while these hats were popular locally, they remained a bit of a cottage industry, though throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, weaving techniques were refined and the quality of the products gradually increased. But it would take another century before the hats would gain worldwide attention, as well as their counterintuitive name. The true revolution for Panama hats came in 1835, when a man named Manuel Alfaro emigrated from Spain to Ecuador in the hopes of a better life. He settled in a place called Monte Cristi, and soon launched himself into the hat business. Until then, hat making had been mostly an artisanal process, done on a small scale at home. Alfaro created a network of weavers that could make large amounts of hats in a streamlined process, allowing them to be exported for the first time, rather than remaining a local product. So at this point we might ask, if the hat was developed and made in Ecuador, why is it named after Panama, an entirely different country a thousand kilometers away? Well, with all due respect to Ecuador, it was not exactly a hub of trade and travel at the time. Most products from Ecuador tended to be sent to the ports of Panama before being spread to the rest of the world, as the Isthmus was a center for transcontinental and transoceanic travel. Alfaro, realizing this, decided therefore to market his hats in Panama for the travelers there and others followed suit. The hats gained great success there amongst the American travelers transiting through Panama on their way to the California Gold Rush in 1849. At the time it was actually easier to sail down to Panama, cross it, and sail back up rather than cross the continental US. These men bought almost a quarter million hats per year. When asked where their hats came from, they would respond, Panama, and the name stuck. It was further cemented in people's minds with the construction of the Panama Canal, where it was popular with the workers digging the structure and especially with a photograph of President Teddy Roosevelt wearing one during a trip to inspect its progress. By then, the name Panama was indelibly associated with the hat, regardless of where it came from. In Ecuador, however, it is still steadfastly called, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Sombrero de Paja Toquilla. Spread to America by the Gold Rush prospectors, the Panama achieved true global success when it was brought to the 1855 Paris World's Fair. It took the fair by storm, selling out and created a large demand for the hats in Europe. French Emperor Napoleon III expressed liking for the hat, impressed much like the Spanish conquistadores three centuries earlier by the fineness of the quality of its weave, which all but ensured its success, compounded when his fellow European royals gave their approval as well, and the Panama spread to Italy and England, becoming the most fashionable summer hat in existence. The Panama's popularity scarcely waned in the latter half of the 19th century, even though it was rivaled as a summer straw hat by the stiffer and more formal boder, which I have talked about in another video. The Panama reigned supreme in tropical climates, however, as it was lighter, and if properly made, could be folded up for travel and not be damaged. In 1898, the US government placed an order for 50,000 Ecuadorian straw hats for its troops headed to fight the Spanish in the Caribbean during the Spanish-American War. 
Many of these soldiers brought the style home with them at the end of the conflict, spreading the Panama even further into the United States. And as I said earlier, it was very popular amongst the workers digging the Panama Canal in the early 20th century. The success of the Panama created a desire to emulate it and compete with it, and in the late 19th century, entrepreneurs set up hat factories in Taiwan, then known as Formosa, to make Panama-style hats out of local plant fibers. These Tamsui hats, while they are said not to be as good in quality as the true Ecuadorian Panama, were a lot cheaper, and spread widely throughout Asia in the early 20th century. Other countries also tried to make their own versions out of any straw fiber they could, but none ever quite managed to achieve either the feel of the tokia straw, nor the fine weaving techniques of the Ecuadorian hatters. For a long time, the Panama came in many different shapes, and to some extent it still does, but it tended to be most commonly found in a sort of gentle bell shape. The current fedora-like shape, like the one I'm wearing, can be credited to Italian hatter Borsellino, who were great vendors of this kind of hat. They gave it its most common current shape to emulate the felt fedoras fashionable in the 1920s, and it has remained to this day. During the post-World War I years, it regained some of the popularity it had earlier lost to the boater in Europe, and it remained extremely popular well after World War II. In 1944, hats were Ecuador's number one export, ahead of even their very lucrative banana industry. Compared to other forms of headwear, the Panama didn't suffer quite as much from the decline in hat wearing in the 1960s. Of course, the practice of wearing a suit in the tropics has, was largely abandoned, with society becoming less formal, and the proportion of people wearing Panama hats did diminish. But as a sun hat, it remains quite popular in sunny vacation spots. A lot of the Panamas found today are not true ones made in Ecuador of Tokia, however. Cheap Chinese-made versions of low-quality straw or even plastic are common in seaside resorts, often peddled to tourists who just want quick protection from the sun and a little more style than a baseball cap. However, these versions are often somewhat shapeless and quickly fray. True Panamas can nonetheless still be found, and are often seen on the heads of celebrities and, interestingly, on a lot of women. Historically a more masculine hat, the Panama is quite unisex today, and a popular style accessory, with actors and actresses, politicians, royalty, and many regular people desiring style in the sun wearing one on bright days. Monte Cristi, where Manuel Alfaro first settled almost two centuries ago, still makes what are considered some of the best Panamas in the world, taking master weavers up to eight months to make per hat, which can sell for several thousand dollars. And in recognition of their mastery and heritage, in 2012, UNESCO added traditional Ecuadorian hat making to their intangible cultural heritage list. So I hope once again that you found this video interesting and will join me again soon for another hat. Until then, I tip my hat to you.